program. Yeah. Well, it seems that we meet again. We meet again. <laughs> Welcome, Davis. Isn't it surreal that now we're doing everything online and we're things that we doing. would have never even done before, possibly? No. You know? At least definitely you? not in this way. No. So, welcome to the archive of untold stories. The round, round two. Round two. <laughs> and this round, this second round, tells the story of uh, the Extinction Survival Archive. I knew it was going to be about this, and that's why I wore this shirt, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of like my camo art uh, fashion, you know, always be prepared. Uh, so It's I, a way you always stand out in the city. The survivalist archive, so yeah, that's good. Definitely. Yeah. So these are the things? These are the things that, th these are the books that consist, that, that, are, uh, that, that consist of the, the, the archive of uh, the the extension the extinction survival archive. Did you do that? Started collecting these books before COVID started, or after? yes, this starts like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I I was uh, the youth for climate protests were going full on, mm -hmm. and uh, I had to empty my uh, my parental house. So that got sold, and there was this whole collection of, well, not a collection, it wasn't a collection, just leftover books mm -hmm. that stayed, and they were going to end in the dumpster. And uh, at the same time, I had to buy new phones for my kids. Well, actually, they bought them because they had, they had their own budget, but it was like, okay, uh, we got the uh, climate emergency, really, really pregnant. It was full on. There was a, finally, 10 years after we lived uh, Occupy Wall Street, 20 years after we had the uh, alternative globalists, uh, we were back at the same point. I had the idea. It's like... So the climate emergency, the climate crisis emergency inspired you to make the survivalist archive? Well, it was, it, was a, it was a combination, like, how am I gonna, uh, how are my kids gonna survive a possible uh, climate apocalypse? And then <laughs> with nothing left to live from, there's, what about agriculture? What about power? And especially power, because they only have knowledge through their iPhones. They only have searched the internet to get in touch with knowledge. Meaning that they don't know how to make fire from like flints and sticks and <clears throat> shoelaces. Probably not, probably not. But are you serious? Are you really nervous about it? Uh, something happening? I mean, we, of course we have like a gazillion apocaly apocalyptic movies and if we cut out all the ones that are zombies and viruses mm -hmm. and aliens mm -hmm. then we have like even like there's a new one greenland that just came out and you know, that was asteroids uh hitting across the planet and uh, southern free and now i'm watching uh, uh snow piercer the series okay and this is where the whole world has totally they knew that they could have done something about the climate challenge but they didn't do it and then the whole world freezed over but then they have a train of a thousand and one cars, mm. and that's all the people left in the universe. In the universe. And then, uh, well, not the universe, on planet Earth. <laughs> and of then course. the train <laughs> just goes around the Earth a all thousand times. Time, that's all it does for years. And, you know, then there's like first class. Because, I mean, yeah, how do you prepare? I mean, my favorite movie in the old days in the 70s was, I don't forget the title, but it was Yul Brynner bald guy yeah. and he had a necklace with a little leather pouch and it was just seeds oh yeah and so he would go and fight all these guys trying to get seeds because these were the last seeds that's one of the things when i presented this last year because you uh, have a lot of things about um, nature right? it's a lot about nature it's like i mean this collection is, is like it's it's a little bit naive Mm -hmm. uh, way of, of gathering it's uh, it's it has a an adult section mm -hmm. with a even a, a sexuality course in there 
And Will uh, people forget how to have sex in the future? Well, you never know what <laughs> might happen. <laughs> you never know. I think I have that book somewhere. Let's let's, let's find it. I don't know where to what to do with this anymore. <laughs> and there's a then there's an, a, a a children's section, uh -huh. which I found really f funny and 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 it was uh, it was a reality check as well because it's that's actually most of my sisters and my own books when you were a kid from when I was a kid early seven well 70s early 80s and it's all about physics it's about uh, geography it's about but also it's it's like the, the little things you get to know through these children and encyclopedia and I was thinking like let's just gather these and then it became a thematic ensemble of a mind help yeah, I mean, do you think that you would be able to survive with just these books? <laughs> <laughs> like, if, if it all hell went down, the said... internet was gone forever, and then you just had these books. I, I said it was naive. I, I mean... It was completely naive. I mean, and now I look at it, and I look at it, it's like, it's like a piece of uh, decor. Right. It's like a... It, this could... If, in one of those movies... Apocalyptic Those ap movies, ap apocalyptic yeah. movies. This could be on the shelves of of a kid. Oh yeah. Trying is like this is what they believed back then. This is what they have left over from uh, an apocalypse, oh. and now in this dystopia, they have that to build their knowledge on, to build their life with. <laughs> <laughs> the great encyclopedia from like 1970s. I'm not sure. I, I mean, mean, there's even there's even the old. My 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 great my grandfather was a, a, a horticulture. Mm -hmm. I even have his courses from school from the nineteen thirties. Mm -hmm. Just like, hey, I mean, I can't throw this away. No, on I the mean, one hand, and then on the other hand, this might be really interesting for information. Well, it might be really interesting if the planet was wiped out and we all died, and aliens arrived. And then they came, and they. This was the only books that were left in the world. <laughs> if these were the only books that were left in the world, that, well, they would have a really grim vision of 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 our of our society as well, because there's some there's some. I mean, seventies was also the the Cold War mm -hmm. times, and there's some books in there that really are just plainly depressing. But they're not like how-to survival books. Oh, I mean, there's, there's one how-to survival book. Um, do you have a go-to bag? I have a go-to bag, which is like... It's like that, I mean, uh, that one in bag. California you grow up, uh, we always have to do earthquake drills. Oh yeah. Where then, ring, 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 and then we all had to like climb underneath yeah? the, uh, the, 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 um, okay. the, uh, Davis is on the knee. <laughs> we, you had to climb underneath the desk or be in the doorway. And yeah. also because we're always in California expecting the big earthquake, yeah. you have a box and a bag of clothes, toothpaste, and a box of water and food to be able to survive. So if you had to suddenly get out, you have a box of all the stuff that you would eat. So that was your reality. Yeah. You well, were I mean, always ready to Yeah, I mean, you have some kind survive of box a possible to prepare if you had to run. Like multiple passports with fake names, big stacks, <laughs> <laughs> big stacks of cash. That's that's a, when a, you were a little older, I a, think. Then, a, yeah, a, a gun, you know, <laughs> at least, you know, so that you always have this in the bottom of the bag. We yeah. don't tell you anybody about those. <laughs> so I, I don't, you don't have that. You don't have a go-to bag. No, no, no. We didn't have a go-to bag. Oh, yeah. I would have loved to have that. Yeah. Let's start that. <laughs> Let's have go-to bags, people. <laughs> and you should always be prepared. I think. But it's also, I mean, when I was mentioning uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement back uh, back in uh, 2008 and then the early 2000s, because uh, we also worked around those teams. Well, we worked, we were kind of a little bit ahead of our time. We worked on the economy and options of what you can invest in, and mostly the challenge of breaking things about climate change. About climate change. I know. And uh, that, was that global disaster. We tried to solve that 10 years ago already with art. We did not do it, did we, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> we made five pieces, and uh, well, maybe it's all about like maybe you're here and your your mission is just to influence one person, and maybe that one person will somehow make the invention 
for the future that will change, but, but we never know. We never know. Well, but we uh, tried. We, we, we are, we're, we're still trying. We're still doing. We're still trying. I mean, still still, this it. is just a next chapter. I mean, we we also did a piece later than that. Really, actually, realized that we did all this work and nothing really happened. Well, um, yeah, art is a huge uh, a challenge. I mean, at least with Seven Promises, where we influence people's behavior by giving them free shots of vodka if they wrote their name down to not eat meat for a month or to, so it was like you can quantify reality. Uh, and we still do that show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's yeah. still up for uh, production. All it's those people that are out there, we uh, we're, we're still we still do we're that still show. Working, just trying to shift the world one vodka shot at a time. Yeah, just check randomscreen.com.be yep. and you'll find the whole descriptive. Now the other one last week we talked about Molly mm -hmm. uh, English, and then the archive was more personal yes. with books uh, of a lot of photographs and personal letters. But this one is more, um, you know, it's just these, these this collection. This is just this collection, and this 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 got me. And what's, what's this? That's a that's a canister. It's a canister. It's, for, it's a surprise well, for later. It's a surprise for later on, maybe. Oh, okay. You can open that up later. We'll keep that one for later, yeah. So, while gathering these books and, and then presenting it to the people, I also, well, one, one person actually got back to me and said, like, seeds are going to be the uh, currency for the future. Yeah, that's If fine. everything, if, if, if everything Where's fails... Where's the seed archive? It's in, the one in Norway? No. It's in Norway. Uh, it's in uh, Spitsbergen, oh. I think. Yeah. Anyway, they had some trouble with humidity or something. With the humidity, because the climate is not functioning as they would like to. It's not it's cold enough anymore. Also, no? No. Uh, well, they had a they had a slight hiccup, I think. Well, with the billions of dollars that they have to invest in it, I'm sure that they're going to figure it out. But they got all their money from their petrol they have so they in have lots Norway of money to invest for the future. Yeah. So yeah, this, this, this actually functions as a, as a, as a starting point. It's just like people can pick up books and browse through it and, and find some information they might find helping out to survive a possible, a possible apocalypse. And because that's, it's quite inadequate, I also started thinking, it's like, okay, we need to start um, a movement or a group of people that can have the information, have the knowledge, share the knowledge to start us, uh, to, to, to get us started again. Yeah, but now you're talking about the In kind of dystopia. people that are, are uh, uh, like Donald Trump supporters, all those guys that march on the Capitol, they're like, uh, you know, completely full-time preppers and I am they actually tons of arsenals of gums and they have bunkers full of milk and water and soup and, and they're ready for uh, the revolution at one time. So do you want, is that what you're asking for us all? That's the inspiration actually. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, we, we, I mean, I live in a city. I live in a city where we're all bunked to, next to each other on a, on, a, on a very tiny space. So I was thinking, it's like, how can we prepare the city for, for uh, a post-apocalypse. Do you grow your own garden? I do some gardening. Yeah, so that's the first step, I guess. Everybody and not very, not very effective. And it's, it's a, I got one courgette last year. <laughs> it's just one. Not I mean, I was happy. Hopefully in the next years, as before the apocalypse happens, you get a little bit better. I really need prepared. to go into to, uh, a, a more robust system of, 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 of growing vegetables. Um, and the knowledge is out there. I know, I mean, I've been contacting several people who could join or at least inform me about this uh, situation. Uh, so I'm looking into people who are like um, finding foods in forests. Uh, but you have all these books about horticulturally, I mean, yeah. so that then how to... But then there's a big difference between knowledge that's written down in books and knowledge that is actually hands-on of course by people who know about it so this week i was supposed to talk to two persons but uh in the end only just one came the other person was really he was ill he i can't we, we can't approach him COVID. Anything. it's not COVID, oh, no yeah. uh, 
Unfortunately, it was a bowel problem, so I couldn't even do a Zoom meeting because the bowel... Okay, let's <laughs> move on, let's move on. And who was the person you did meet? So, uh, I, uh, I invited uh, a good old friend of mine, uh, because our kids went to the same school, Geert Palmers, who is... Um, uh, he's an engineer. He specialized in um, uh, solar panels and, and renewable energy. Yeah. And he ran, he ran a study bureau for more than 20 years now. He's taking a little step back to see how he's going to take a next step in his life. But now I just had the, the, fun, the fun of getting him over. And so I, I would like to introduce him by the one of the books that maybe uh, typecasts him a little bit, and that's the the rich the riches of Mother Earth. Oh yeah, that one. Let's take out that one. Mm. Coal, we love coal. Mm. It's coal, and it's and again it's that relic of the seventies. This is one of the books that I read as a kid. And it actually tells you about all the ways on how we gather energy. Or energy. It starts with lava. Geothermal. Geothermal things? Well, not really. Just the lava. It explains to kids what elements are, what the, what the weather is like, how layers go, and how eventually coal is produced and how do you get it back from the earth? These things all we the know, no? Different all coal fields. Yeah, it was I would just it was one of those things like, oh look at these. It's like the funny the funny stuff from the seven from the seventies. Where they were really thinking like this is our future. Oh, yeah. This is our future. It's like we need to get everything, have gather all this knowledge about where the oil fields are, and uh, so yeah. World this exploration. Is world exploration. What products do we get from petrol? Uh, all the all the so nice this, things we so get. So you're from giving petrol. a little bit of education for us, aren't you, Sam? It's a little bit of a, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so bloody naive I'm looking at these how books. How does coal exist? <laughs> so naive, but then again, it's, it's a... Uh, but it's also it's, surreal because we're looking at a book from the 1980s, too. Yeah. And now they would be talking about carbon capture and the possibilities that we can still use our coal mines while they're also trying to throw them down, close them, but then you could also use carbon capture to keep them open. And, um, and hopefully get some stuff out of there. Look. But cl in a cleaner way. Mm -hmm. So anyway. So this is connected to Geert? This is connected to Geert. And I had a, a talk with him this week. And I, uh, I flicked through different... Uh, I, I, I uh, organized... I, I had, had several... I have several items from our talk. So we can like, oops, I just, you can pick one out because there's nine, there's nine pieces to look at. We're just going to go for a few. I, I, there's a little directive maybe, it's like, what could we talk about? Uh, I find this one interesting the back to the future because the whole idea and challenge about the climate change and is that sometimes it's always focusing on denial like five years ago ten years ago was the best we ever had it we could drive for a very cheap we could fly all over the place and the only way to advance in the future is then to fly less drive less and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> I still want to be able to fly. So is it really like we have to go back to a, a something else or do we create a new possibility? Of course, if you made plane flights, a thousand euros to go from here to Berlin, much less people would go to Berlin. Yeah. You would find other alternatives. 
But I think that we have fought so long and hard to be able to create a world that can do that. Um, now I know that now the world is shifting because a lot of things are now going to go more online, which is good. But I still think that um, we should be able to enjoy what we have fought so long and far to be able to have the benefits. And so this, I wonder if that's about this. Like, does it's, it mean that you have to go back and do less, buy less, enjoy less? I asked him the question, like, what, what there's, there's, there's two ways of handling this. Uh, there's, there's, he, he's, an, he's an engineer, so oh. he believes in the future, he believes in technology, or what's the other uh, position uh, people take? It's like, no, we have to take a step back, refocus on our connection with nature and our surroundings, yeah. and actually go back. And that's uh, one of the things he, he talked about. Just so let's look at that one. That's numbed. There are many uh, streams of thinking in, in that respect, and one of them is frugal engineering. It was a, an engineer who made a career shift, and he was looking to statistics of uh, newborn children and it seems that the lack of having access to couveuses, I don't know in English mm -hmm. the word, is a major factor which can bring really a leapfrog difference. Mm -hmm. So that engineer, frugal engineering, he was thinking how can I make a couveuse with uh, elements which can be maintained by local population inherently. And he was very smart and he said, what technology does always work in my country? And suddenly he got the right idea, he said, a Toyota pickup always works. If your Toyota pickup breaks down on a crossroads, there are five Africans coming to repair it locally and Everybody you can, knows. within one hour, you're driving again. So he composed a couveuse based on components of a Toyota pickup. So the lamp of the Toyota pickup he used to heat the couveuse and all other components were coming from a Toyota pickup. Oh. So that's a startup company, that's frugal engineering. So meaning that you only use components which can be served, supplied, resilient society yeah. from the local industrial community. So th that's a tendency. And that's, that's the tendency I support and I like what I don't like and that has its roots in the 70s in the early ecological movement that's the idea that you're only resilient and sustainable if you're self-supporting on a very small scale. Small scale yeah. uh, as I said our robustness and even sustainability from our current energy system comes from interlinkages, connectivity on an international yeah. scale, combination of decentralization, centralization, these um, isolated communities producing everything locally itself, I think it's less sustainable than this interconnected system. That's my personal opinion. And that's for me a wrong route. Uh, and we should not tell people that's the right route. Okay. We're gonna go In global. nature, there are very few robust things which are not a combination of the best of all worlds. All things, uh, yeah. yeah. And usually nature is right. So he doesn't want us to create our own communities that are self-sustaining. I thought that that would be a good proposal. Well, well he actually said that, that it's, it's, only, it's only sustainable if you're also interconnected on a larger scale, actually. Uh, the way, I mean, he reflects on, on, on that system because of his input as an as a energy consultant as well. I mean, he knows about the grid, he knows about everything that is interconnected and so he sees um, two different types either you have you have the solar system that is a good a good a good system for the cities because it's decentralizing mm -hmm. but then you have um, uh, wind turbine parks on the sea which is centralized because it only comes through one cable but then it's also interconnected so he actually lays the it's it's a it's like the uh, the parallel between that grid and how we should organize uh, ourselves, it's... Uh, I mean, that's, I still, I want, my, advice. I want my chocolate. So if I was like self-sustaining in a small commune in the middle of Portugal, 
I don't think I'm going to be able to grow cocoa leaves still. So then I do need to be inter. You need to be. You <laughs> always need to be interconnected. I mean, I mean, <laughs> we're so connected in this world already. It would be it, it would be stupid to s shut off from well, our connections anyway. Can we listen to the system for just to get the the basis? Yeah, that's a a, a slightly longer uh, fragment, but it's uh, it, yeah. It, it sets tells, everything else up? It sets everything else up and it tells you about how we got electrified here in Brussels. The first electricity grants? First electricity. What were they? Interesting. Coal? No. Let's figure out. He's going to tell us. <laughs> Number one. Let me maybe start with the fact that um, I think ap apocalyptic thinking is, is very common in times of uncertainty. and. Uh, if you combine the uncertainty we have now with COVID crisis globally, with economic crisis upcoming, uh, we don't know in what extent it will, will occur and have impact. The uh, geopolitical tensions which are giving a lot of uncertainty. So your question then returns to how robust is our system that in worst case we can still have that comfort for human beings, for citizens to enjoy heat, cold, our iPhone, our transport, mm -hmm. our mobility and so on. To answer that question we need to clearly understand how our system is composed and how vulnerable these components are. And let's go back and I think it's very nice to do this story in the city of Brussels because Brussels is uh, without any doubt a pioneer in the steps in energy history. In um, 1813, the first uh, time it was done to extract gas from coal and to use that gas to light buildings inside, outside. Mm -hmm. So that's early 19th century. So it was the first time that we had public lighting in Belgium and Brussels. Now, interesting enough is that these companies who were exploiting these gas factories um, were also the ones who managed the transport at that time. And at that time, so 19th century, the transport for, uh, in the city center of Brussels were horses. Mm -hmm. So you had taxi drivers alike with horses. Second phase of the 19th century, so you had tramways yeah. pulled by horses. The problem of that system was that you needed typically 10 horses for one tram because horses got okay. sick, exhausted. Uh, they could only do 30 kilometers a day, so it was not a, a big thing. Uh, a second problem which was completely underestimated, when that transport system became very popular, you had a lot of manure. And there was a scientific conference of urban planners in the end 19th century trying to solve that problem, but they stopped the conference halfway because there was no solution, because the only solution to get that high volume of manure out of the street was to use horses who were producing manure as well, so it was a vicious circle, <laughs> so it, they didn't have a prob uh, solution. But now come back to energy, the interesting thing is that these gas companies were controlling the transport companies with the horses, the same companies, mm -hmm. and in 1880, if I'm not mistaken, Edison, the big inventor of uh, the electric bulb, he asked the concession uh, in Brussels to produce electricity, mm -hmm. which was extremely innovative. And that was, um, you probably know the Museum of Contemporary Art of the city of Brussels, mm -hmm. uh, Place Saint Catherine, Nelson Street. Yeah. That building was the site where I think 10 years after the concession asked by Edison, the first electricity was produced in Belgium and in Brussels on that spot. What's happening is that this electricity was much more efficient to light with the bulb of Edison that the gas companies got extremely nervous. They felt competition and as it is happening now in politics, these gas companies signed long-term contracts with all municipalities in Brussels that they mm -hmm. had to take off gas for decades. So Edison was blocked, it was a legal fight during many years and as is happening now, what happened? The gas companies bought the electricity companies and it became integrated companies uh, with gas supply 
transport and uh, electricity. Now what happened in the next step is that these integrated companies uh, started to electrify the tramways. So the horse stock reduced. You had steam engines with coal for the outside, the suburbs and other cities, and inside the city with electrified tramways. So in 100 years you came from different inventions to a very heavily electrified system. And then the, the, the history continues. So in the 20th centuries you see uh, centralization of power station because the local power stations cannot cope with the growing demand. Everybody wants to light houses, streets and so on with electric power. The transport gets electrified, so we need big power stations. And the uh, heritage of that you can see uh, the power station in Vilvoorde, Drogenbos, Neder over Heimbeek, who's incinerating our wastes and producing of the waste heat electricity. So you see major industrial sites producing electricity for distribution beyond their borders. Yeah. That's a new thing in the 20th century. Now, a next phase in that is nuclear power in the 50s, starting 60s, 70s, 80s, and the international grid connection. So we are uh, getting strongly connected to France, Netherlands, UK through the uh, canal uh -huh. to Germany. And lately, uh, that's a very positive thing, is that the connection with offshore wind farms is, is, is getting uh, serious. That being said, coming back to Brussels, we started with decentralized energy. We got to centralized energy because of the growing demand. We got to a much more electrified system, but a very interconnected system. Mm -hmm. uh, so what our robustness should not be measured to the production locally but to the linkage and the redundancy of linkage in the system even beyond Belgium. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely strongly developed. Now, a, a final uh, chapter in my historical overview is what's happening lately. In the 90s, um, scientists discovered the uh, climate change uh, occurrence. Mm -hmm. That did rethink the energy system because it's uh, evident that as soon as possible we need to get rid of fossil fuels. So to do that we need renewable energy sources. I mentioned offshore winds, uh, onshore winds, but for a city the only compatible technology on large scale is solar. The very unique thing of that technology is that it um, has no moving parts. Mm which is very strange for an energy producing technology, so there is no maintenance needed. It has a very long lifetime. Mm -hmm. Because of no moving parts, there is no degradation of the parts. Secondly, it makes no noise. Everything what happens is silent. And it gives no exhaust, no pollution. Mm -hmm. There is no technology in history which produces energy from light, which is silent, no moving parts, no noise. So it's amazing. So for me, that's pure poetry in the energy business. That's why I started in, in that sector and I'm still in that sector. It talks about the most wonderful thing about the latest push towards solar panels. Yeah. Which uh, it's great, yeah, they're silent. They don't have any moving parts except the sun that moves. Uh, and that it, uh, wasn't there one, no moving parts? No exhausts. No exhaust and everything. Only problem is, is that it rains in Belgium 200 days of the year. So if you don't have the sun... <laughs> they're still, they're, well, they're still active. I mean... <laughs> so there's, a, there's some details that are still need to be ironed out. Well, that's the nice thing. If you're thing. living in a place that it rains 200 days of the year, and another 100 days have clouds, and another 65 are sunny, then that's going to be a great challenge. But we embrace that problem. I mean, he looks at it from the scientific side scientific of the thing. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's fun to hear him talk and hear, hear his confidence also. He's very excited about that, I know. Yeah. So hopefully that, I mean, because the biggest challenge is always about storage, right? There's some storage, and I mean, there's some, he talks a little bit about storage as well, but it's only just coming. Wow, just to be it's only just coming, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that are we've been on he says we've been on the forefront of renewables mm, only 20 so years. On, since 20 years and now it's sustainable without subsidies 
So he says like the next thing is uh, is, is is actually going into uh, discovering new opportunities of storage beyond the Tesla battery and because uh, he um, it's, it's in one of these somewhere. But let's do something else first. I would like to ask you to choose three books um, during the course of this talk and uh, the first one is like which book talks to you or to a part of you can can you ident can you identify with okay let's okay have very good In silence one. silence you need silence for that does it talk to you <laughs> it talk? if you're talking i can't hear the book <laughs> it's whispering to you <laughs> let me be able to hear uh, Uh, they're pretty quietly done. They're pretty quiet in there, and, and the, the good thing is, is like uh, since they're all in Dutch, and you're obviously not Dutch speaking, we're just gonna have to do it with the, with the with the illustrations, I think. Yeah, but also some. I mean, yeah. Out of all the books, the one that speaks to me, or the one that I feel that if I was gonna have to get out there, then it would be. Uh, this one. This one, yes. Because this, do you mind if I put it on top? Yes, yeah, 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 just put it on top. Because this kind of probably is a little bit like how to get water out of a cactus and how to start fires and how to, what plants to eat and things like that. This is the, this, the, this is the, the stuff it's, yeah, this is the, the stuff that. Is that, that from that, when you were a kid? That's from you when were, I was a kid. I made uh, those things, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the nicest books I got as a kid being a boy scout and all yeah uh this was like i should have this in my pockets all the time because I, I i won't learn it by heart <laughs> i should i should have well, and we actually things, should i mean i think everybody should know how to be able to start a fire yeah like bear gillis you know be able to start bear a fire gillis. yeah how to make a hook out of like a a piece of bamboo and to yeah. be able to fish so this is this is uh, the, the SAS. It's a, it's from the it's actually a publication from the Secret Air Services. So it's like the Belgian or is English? no the in the UK. The UK. Yeah. The, it's the British Special Air Services Handbook on Survival. Ah. But vulgarized, of course, because it was plainly. I, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people of my age have the same book. Heert had the same book as yeah. a kid as well. Do you know how to do this? Uh, to, to, to do the... Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Especially now that my kids... Uh, Are older. Doing, doing HBO... Uh, 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 EHBO. Doing... doing uh, Brownies? No, no. <laughs> no, no. They're learning how to uh, do... Do the... Um, know the, they know the actions of... What's it called? Uh, um, how to give... Uh, uh, What's it called in English? Uh, mouth to mouth. Mouth to mouth. Mouth and, to mouth, and, and, also and, that then and, when and you respiratory, and, respiratory and, system. And then when you <laughs> when you go into the heart, yeah. you have to do it to the sound of of, of um, the Bee Gees. Yes. Staying, staying alive, alive. Staying alive. alive. Ha, 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 ha. Staying alive. <laughs> staying alive. Yeah. Ha, ha. And people have saved people because you have to do it at that speed. At that speed. Um, in order to do. It. But also, how to pierce your thorax. Somebody's thorax. I don't know if you're going to be able to pierce your own thorax. Uh, it's now a this, thorax, this right? Or is it the... Ooh, knots. Nuts. Knots are very good. Even in other circumstances. So yeah, it's, it's, this, this book's... It's, it's, it's everything. It covers a little bit of everything. It covers a little bit of everything. Uh, find, tracking tracking animals. edible animals. Which reptiles are edible, maybe? Which birds are edible? Insects that might be edible? All the plants. Oh. And these are really like the local things. I mean, this actually grows in my garden now. Do you eat it? Yeah. I, I'm actually pushing to get an edible garden, oh. a wild edible garden. Oh. So it's all the plants. I hope to find a girl who would guide me through the city to do this. Or a man. Or a man. Or maybe a small child. Maybe an animal. I, I knew this girl who did these tours and, and uh, I really want to find her back, but I haven't been able to contact her again. Oh, very yeah. important one. The edible ones, the non-edible ones. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, is it really not edible or is it more like trippy edible? It's, well, 
We know the trippy ones. What are the I ones assume? with the little spots on it? The red uh, spots? Ah, uh, there they are. There they are. That's poisonous. That's if you really are getting down on your husband or your <laughs> wife, <laughs> and then you chop those up really yeah. small. And uh, I mean, but still with these, with with these images, I might not. Oh no! If you're I'm, captured I'm, by by marauders, and yeah. then you have to figure out how to escape. Then you could use these mushrooms to put in their tea. That's how Snow White escaped from. No, that's how the Wicked Witch tried to. She put a she put a uh, no a spell on an apple. She no? put a spell on an apple, but I don't think she gave her much. I guess I guess in your in the original ones it was something. I think but it, it's 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 also on Alice in Wonderland and then oh, the yeah. Snow White. Oh, that was LSD, right? Previous. Oh. Anyway, I mean it's still tricky. How long, have you, tricky this, how long have you had this book? Uh, I, I got this when I was 12, I think. Is this like SAS for dummies? Oh, no, it's not. It's no, just no, no, no. It's, it's really before like the dummy realm. Yeah. I mean, it's the... Ooh. Oh, no. I thought that that was like a, a bear trap. There is, there, there is bear traps in there. There's also ways, like ways of building a house. I mean, it's really like... I should plastify this whole book and, and, and put it in a, a metal box somewhere and make sure I don't... No, I think that this is a reminder that everybody should have at least one book like this that teaches you a little bit of everything and that, it, uh, that you know how to do ties, you know how to make fire, so that if the horrible circumstance comes, that then we can do something to be a little bit prepared. I mean, as a survivalist. A lot of these things I, I actually, like half of it I know, and, and the other half, I should always like, ooh, I need to get back into the book again. Yeah, I wish I had some rope then. I would like to see what you actually know. Well, uh, do you know a Dick Turpin? The... The knot? The Dick Turpin? The Dick Turpin knot? No. Ah, well, these, ah, these are all the... Ah, all the fishing ones. The fishing ones. If you want to go fishing next week, because that was the plan. Yes. Let's I feel like that's the last these. hunter-gatherer thing that I could possibly do, because I don't want to go into the woods and hunt boar, and I don't know if that's legal, but you can actually go fishing, and then you can catch... I don't like to release it. If I catch it, I you want, want to, to eat, eat it. it. Yeah. We, we go sailing from time to time, and then we catch fish, and they're actually horrible. What do you mean? Not every fish is, a, is, 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 is as nice to eat. No, of course. Some are just more bony. So yeah. So this learning about weather, learning about so yeah, this was a um, a first step. If I had to survive, and you then would I would take grab this book. book, and you would be with me because we would go together, of and course. you would be able to translate, and then I would learn all how to tie the knots and the fishing hooks, and you would learn the traps, and uh, we would pass that knowledge on. Yeah, this is a necessary one. Yeah. But would you like to know everything that's in there by heart? Uh, well. No, I would might want to make sure that I have the, the book. Yeah, I think that book. you should like know a little bit. I mean, how to like you know stop a wound, how to do some sewing of a wound, how to uh, start a fire, um, knots, um, animals, navigation, navigation. I mean, it's really then you're really talking about. I mean, it's a very bit of a stretch that you're going from get talking about you know yeah. Uh, energy and possibilities for the future into a whole ecological breakdown into a kind of I wanted fight the, or flight. I wanted the reality check. I mean, is, is it going to be so problematic? And that's, that's one of the things he actually said, like, no, 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 the system is so robust it can't fail. Well, that's what it says, too big to fail. But it, well, I would rather have something... Can we go back to him for one moment? Yeah. The, the uptake, does he give us some positive? Well, that's the only worry he has now. We can, we can look at it. It's one of the worries that still are there now um, regarding the problem. It's just like, and it's about the, the speed of implementation. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. So actually, the premises is wrong. They will have electricity. I'm, I, I can firmly say that I don't think we can go to a, we will go to a collapse in our energy system. The only 
worry I still have is that um, the contribution of the energy sector to climate change is, is important. Mm -hmm. We have the technology to solve that, but the uptake of the technology in society is going extremely slow. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a great technology which is competitive and which is as poetic, as I said, no noise, no moving, and mm -hmm. so on. It takes two, three decades before you get in the energy balance of the world to make the difference. Mm -hmm. So for me, the speed of implementation and the legislation to allow that is the most critical factor to limit the climate change uh, impact of the energy sector. But that's something different than your question. I yeah. don't think we go to, uh, we don't go to uh, a drowning energy mm -hmm. sector and an interruption of our comfort. So no Mad Max scenarios. No. Mad Max scenarios. <laughs> no Mad Max scenarios. It was well that that drowned our whole project, of course. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's always good. To, you never know what's around in the future. You know? No, but then he said we shouldn't worry about that, and then that's a, I he actually said that there kind won't of like, be a breakdown. He said there won't be a breakdown, and actually that. Maybe that's some of the scary things actually that he said is like you shouldn't worry about an actual breakdown but then it, what if the actual breakdown actually happens the breakdown is happening well the breakdown the is breakdown happening is happening in Texas where the whole grid has been out for 2 weeks people are dying people are bro broken in you have pictures oh, yeah. of people with icicles inside their ceiling people that have COVID and not able to charge their oxygen tanks. This is a complete apocalyptic breakdown. They can't go out of their house. They can't go shopping. They are, it's a huge disaster. And that was when the grid gets too overwhelmed because of the COVID that then everybody was so much at home that then it just blew up the system. So that was a, a breakdown that they're trying to solve right at this moment. I've been so busy this week that I haven't even <laughs> realized that. They're, they have to learn how Thank to make you. fire completely. So imagine, imagine being having the coldest days here in Belgium, and you have no heat and no electricity. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I live, I live in a, um, I live in an apartment that only has electricity as a source of uh, yeah. energy and central heating, don't you? It has central heating, and that needs gas. But uh, I don't think I can, I can count on uh, central heating in the future. And everything that's, I mean, I cook electrically, and everything is electric in my house. So if there was a big surge. I'll be, I, I can't even break out my floor because it's not even wood. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be stuck. But you probably have a lot of cans of sardines like I do because when the yeah. COVID happened in April last year, then I, and you couldn't go out of your house except for the store. I bought like 30 cans of sardines and like 40 bags of pasta because I thought that maybe you would like not be able to, I like that, that the, the, and uh, have you eaten sardines since? No, I have. They're just stuck there. And they're, just, they're part of my go back. They're, <laughs> they're part, part of your go back. <laughs> but if yeah. you ever want sardines, you can always come over for it. So. Okay. So, uh, next I would like you to choose a book that actually scares you. A book that scares me. What's the other one? It might scare you. Um. Which is which? Which 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 represent the scare that you might want to have in this situation? Or well, maybe you should go back to the survival thing because that's that's the scary thing. Um, I think that uh, I have to say it. <laughs> this one, <laughs> but I, I don't know if it would be exactly this. I think that I would like to have a book about street fighting because I have um, never been in a fight before. Yeah. I've had my nose, uh, I've had a bloody nose before, but that was during sex. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even a fight. And it was more of an accident, I think. <laughs> and I had, it, I had a bloody nose when uh, during one of the performances I did, um, uh, we were fighting on stage and he actually hit me. But uh, in an apocalyptic world, I would be very scared to, to have to fight for people. I'd be one of those people that would, I would have like, um, I would hire somebody to um, protect you. To pr no, to protect us. Like, to protect I would us. like cook the food or do something else, and then 
He's uh, like no. We need warriors. Yeah, I need some warriors, and I'll and need more we'll the train them. We'll train them with this book. Well, judo. I, I um, if well, people are coming to break down my door and steal my supplies, I don't really want to flip them unless I can flip them out the window, and then they can fall like a bunch of. Flips. It's the noble art of. <laughs> I mean, it's the noble art of self-defense. Judo. Yes, it so is, it's, it's, a, it's probably going to be. I don't know. Have you ever been in a fight? I've. I've uh, I haven't really been in a fight. I hit some people when, when I, I still picture it in front of, before me. It's Did they hit you first? They hurt me first. They hurt your feelings? They hurt, uh, they Did you hurt call me. You, they, they call hurt you me. four eyes? No, no, no. <laughs> they hurt me. They, they, I, I was picked on and then, uh, and then uh, he, we, we had a confrontation in the, in the hallway. It was in school, boarding school. And then he kicked me in the nuts. Oh! He, he, dressed, he, dressed my, he dressed my scarf. It was like, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't have done that. And then he kicked me in the balls with his knee. Next thing, it was, I mean, it was in the hallway. Uh, his neck was against the, uh, the, 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 the wall. The wall, but, but, but also with the, where you, where you hang, hanging your, uh, your Coats, jackets yeah. on. <laughs> his neck was... Almost pierced through. Pierced, in, 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 and I just started hitting his face. And that's the one time I actually physically beaten up somebody. So we're both not so experienced. I not at all. I saved my life in a firefight with like bows and arrows and guns and uh, like. But at least you already told me how to work with guns. <laughs> yes, we did. We did learn how to do, use guns. So that's that's another cool. production that's still <laughs> on offer. It's we're not like here. What we're, you need to know. We're here to give you an experience. Randomscreen.be. No, 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 no. But it's important. I mean, it's, we've been working on these kind of things all, in, all our careers. In, in the circumstance. So yes, I would like to learn how to fight. Uh, that would be one. So when you say something that fear gives me fear, yes, I have a, a fear of, of uh, I don't getting know, I like, getting beaten I, up. I, I like well, yeah, <laughs> kind of fear of getting beaten up. I like watching fighting. Uh, I don't have a problem watching fighting. I like Ernest Hemingway. Oh no, Norman Mailer was always he was really an avid fan of fighting because he said it was all about knocking somebody out of time. Like we have our timeline, and that you just try to knock somebody out of this timeline for 10 seconds. So and you then, have the advantage. And so, well, not the advantage, then you win the boxing match because yep. he's really into boxing. So I, I kind of like that knocking people out of time. But so I, as a fear, yes, I would like to learn how to fight. I don't know if this is purely the best example, whether I need to learn how to judo or uh, maybe I could like, you know, get a it's, samurai sword and learn like in Japan for like the summer. I mean, it was, it was what I had at hand at the time that I was asking the question. So it was like, okay, this will save me. <laughs> Shall we go to the last one of... Um, yeah, of just him? the last. What you, which, do you have one in specific that you uh, think is good? How soon, maybe? Or how renewable is the renewable? But if it's the last one. But that's the last one. That's the last, last one. That's just the... the oh, we're not uh, doing I'm just going to take oh, yeah. that one for, uh, for just, just to say goodbye to the people. The epilogue. Oh, the okay. epilogue, yeah. This is actually the same as that, but in short. <laughs> we could have done that in three minutes instead of eight. Sorry, people. Um, it's about too big to fail, but he explained that. The, renew the, the, the renewability of renewables. Is it sustainable? Well, I like this one. How soon is now? Or, is, or does it feel like you're repeating? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's one of the major questions. It's like, is it going to work? I don't know. Would you like to try that one? Yes, let's do that. How s Research is accelerating drastically. And if you look to the um, energy decisions Biden took, mm -hmm. the major thing is investing heavily in innovation, accelerating innovation to market. So that's a good example where in a few weeks time he has put a plan on the table which is drastically accelerating all routes mm -hmm. which can contribute to the mitigation of climate change. So that's happening. The Green Deal of, of European Commission, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of that because of the same reason. Mm -hmm. It's acknowledging that there is a big problem and that as a continent we need to be at the forefront uh, to be leading thought maker and technology development and the budgets have have increased mm -hmm. so I think that's happening 
My only fear, as I mentioned before, is that once you have a technology which is capable of doing the job, to get it implemented and have the whole value change, chain um, operational to that's deliver the effect you need, that's another story. It means adoption by society, it means regulatory framework. I'm optimistic on technology side and I'm pessimistic on the rate of implementation and delivering the effect you need to cope with climate change. Okay. And that is something I don't see in the minds, uh, not of citizens, not of politicians, to make mm -hmm. that uh, more effective, more the opposite. But um, when he says more about that society adapts it, mm -hmm. are you talking about that the big business or are you talking about the people? Because I don't think people are going to care if their energy comes from solar or if it comes from wind, as long as the lights still go on and off. So what yeah. do you mean that, that it's who... who Adoption is, and, and I mean... You mean the big business or... It's the same as the uptake. I mean, it's, it's not going uh, fast enough, mm -hmm. especially with regards to the uh, climate change problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking tipping points in 10, 20 years, and he's talking developments that are maybe coming in the next decades. So uh, that's, that was specifically the, the question I, I wanted to get answered is like, yes, but you're talking, well, evolution of a system, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this is like, there's an urgency, God damn it. As Greta Thunberg always is reminding us. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's one of the things that... The house So, and that's what can happen, no? Yes, bang! bang. And then suddenly <laughs> everything, everything goes, falls apart. Falls apart. The whole world falls apart. I mean, that was what it was like when we had the Icelandic volcano erupt. Oh, yeah. Because that stopped all the plane travel instantly. And uh, that really made a huge shift. And then that cloud of ashes made a kind of uh, ceiling that then the sun was reflected. And so the whole temperature of the whole world came down. Uh, we had this already in, a, in, in the 1800s with a, with a meteor exploding in, in, in Siberia and then... Creating Europe, an ash cloud around the Creating an ash cloud around the planet and Europe turned like dark for weeks. Yeah, and that's what they're trying to do also like um, chemically yeah. to create a kind of cloud. So I hope we're back with the crowd. Uh, this wasn't scenerized, this wasn't planned, but it actually was a power cut. <laughs> no. Um, I would like to ask you to choose one more book. The last one. The last one. And this time I would like to uh, ask you to, the, the one that, which book is the most pleasing to the 10 year old in you? Oh, that's not very far from, but my age. Well, it's, <laughs> all these books are from our age anyway. This one. Robots. Well, just because I was really into C-3PO and into Star Wars, and I think, well, it's my 10-year-old, but also as I think about the future, automation, and, you know, what, what is the... Are you afraid of artificial intelligence? Because now I've been seeing calls out. There's tons of calls now on the Club de Opportunity for... for, for residencies and there's a big one to do something with AI yeah. as an experiment and uh, are you are you fearful for artificial intelligence? I'm not fearful as, as long as mm, no 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 not really I mean I, I think it's uh, it's interesting how machines can learn uh, their own ways and, and and I mean it's 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 necessary even because because we're ra not rational thinkers and if AI would be more rational in making decisions for certain things, that would be mm -hmm. welcome. On the other hand, we all know the scenarios, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. We all know the scenarios about the... Terminator. I mean, 
I mean, the last, the last, the last things with AI that's coming up is drones with AI who can decide who gets to be killed or not. It's true, and also Boston Electronics with the dancing routine that they had <laughs> that they did very well. I mean, I mean, I think that AI or robotics should evolve the future in actually not a survivalist way, but more of another way where they take over more things, making food, making cars, everything, so that then we all just have a universal income of a couple thousand a month and we never have to work again and then we just have to think about what do we want to do with our time. Yeah. <laughs> so if robots can help us with that, then I would... I would. But that's really the vision of, the, of, the, of, of how we saw robots in the 70s and 80s even. It's going to help us out. But actually, I think, I think AI is going to be something that helps you out as a person, maybe to be a better person, because it's going to question your... Because I'll be then transhuman and have like a, an AI heart. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> That's Iron Man. That's Iron Man, yes. I know, I think it's, it's like the, the robots were supposed to help humanity. Mm -hmm. Instead, and and, and, and then always, all the bad movies they always take over. And, uh, and then the bad movies they take over, but it also it, it's also taking over our jobs. Automation is 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 making us lose our jobs, and people also don't find their goals anymore in life. Sometimes that's the challenge. But then you have to find something. I mean, I, society would completely break down if people did not go to the factory and work nine to five but drilling holes. Because then they then do that because we need it in the society that we're living in now. And then they live their weekend on the weekend pretending that they're Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible instead of just only pursuing their own pleasure. So, I mean, yeah, it would be a, a tremendous shift in reality. Do you remember the guy during the TEDx that I did in, in mm -hmm. Antwerp? And there was a guy that's transhuman that he had a... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Electronic Color, thing yeah. in his in his chest, and it would always vibrate when he's facing north. Yeah, he's and he's he's feeling colors. He's feeling colors. Yeah, but it wasn't hooked up to his eyes. How do you do that? It was electronically implanted somehow. So it must have been behind his eyeball. No, no, no. no. He could feel the colors. Th then how? So did some something something that he was looking at, he oh, could yeah. analyze the colors were were being analyzed. And then that was transposed into something signaling him in his brain. Hmm. Wasn't it? You also, Sounds I mean, good, right? I mean uh, the, the first time I saw uh, art like that was Stellark. Right, of course. With his third arm, and then and his, and now he's growing an, an ear on his arm. Um, well, he did. Robots. So yeah, I mean, that's my 10-year-old self. Artificial intelligence. I think that they're going to help us out. I mean, that's the whole point about then actually technology will just save us. People like, uh, you know, Trump and them. It's amazing how the, a completely different now view of the world, how now possibilities of the Green New Deal, now America signs the Climate Change Accord. So it's like a complete 90, uh, 180. 180, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, I mean, uh, he, there's, there's, he talks about this in, in one of these uh, fragments still. I'm gonna put these on last, you can, we can, you, you'll be able to like watch the whole talk because it's, uh, it's quite interesting how he goes from one thing to the other. Uh, and just to conclude this all off. I'd Make like sure that everybody gets a book that has at least information that you always have. Make sure everybody has a go bag. <laughs> A go back so that then you never know what might happen that then you need to be able to get out of the house and you have everything inside there fake passports you know one some kind of weapon some uh, kind of uh, weapon. and at least some books about how to teach you how to like hot wire cars and things like that you know yeah what plants there's are car edible. books in there there's there's there's, there's, there's <laughs> lots of stuff there's there's books on physics there's books on herbs uh, and everybody's Welcome to flick through them and find the, the information he needs. Yes. He might think they, to they survive. think that they might need. Learn yeah. how to forge or you know, different information. Yeah. And how are we going to conclude this? We're going to conclude this with, with, with what we are doing, actually. Will art save us? We never know. So back to the last one, Gert. Back to the last one with Gert. And it's actually, it's a, we're going to say goodbye in the same movement. Um, this was the Extinction Survival Archive. Thank you, Mr. 
Vai na Obra Thank you, Mr. Dave Freeman. Uh, go look into uh, this, this, this. These are going to come up on the screen, on, on the streams, on my YouTube account later on. Uh, but just like, say goodbye. Art here. will save us. Yes. Hit. Thank you for this talk. Thank you, Sam. Um, so I, I don't I don't have to worry anymore. You have my phone number if everything collapses. <laughs> that's, that's great. I have a good insurance. <laughs> yeah. So you don't think we're gonna we th we're not gonna have to go into the energy debate if we want to start up uh, our our Brussels preppers movement. It's it's very interesting, and theater will will engage people. But let's make sure that you engage them for the right thing. And the robustness yeah. of the system is, is not a big challenge. No. Let's engage them to make the climate impact of our system under control. Under control. And yeah. that's urgent and that's important. Yeah. But the initial question of robustness, let's forget that for the next two dec decades. Okay. We're not going to have to repower that uh, station at St. Catherine. In a, in, a, in a very short time. It's repowered with contemporary art. Let's, yes. uh, <laughs> let's push that. Let's push that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam.